a severe southwesterly gale on the fourth day out forced us to heave to. I would have liked to have run before the wind, but the sea was very high and the James Caird was in danger of broaching to and swamping. The delay was vexatious, since up to that time we had been making 60 or 70 miles a day. Good going with our limited sail area. We hove to and a double reefed mainsail and our little jigger and waited for the gale to blow itself out. During that afternoon we saw bits of wreckage, the remains probably of some unfortunate vessel that had failed to weather the strong gales south of Cape Hall. The weather conditions did not improve and on the fifth day out the gale was so fierce that we were compelled to take in the double reefed mainsail and hoist our small jib instead. We put out a sea anchor to keep the James Caird's head up to the sea. This anchor consisted of a triangular canvas bag fastened to the end of the painter and allowed to stream out from the bows. The boat was high enough to catch the wind and as she drifted to leeward, the drag of the anchor kept her head to windward. Thus our boat took most of the seas more or less end on. Even then, the crests of the waves often would curl right over us, and we shipped a great deal of water, which necessitated unceasing bailing and pumping. Looking out a beam, we would see a hollow like a tunnel formed as the crest of a big wave toppled over onto the swelling body of water. A thousand times it appeared as though the James Caird must be engulfed, but the boat lived. The south-westerly gale had its birthplace above the Antarctic continent, and its freezing breath lowered the temperature far towards zero. The sprays froze upon the boat, and gave bows, sides and decking a heavy coat of mail. This accumulation of ice reduced the buoyancy of the boat, and to that extent was an added peril. But it possessed a notable advantage from one point of view. The water ceased to drop and trickle from the canvas, and the spray came in solely at the well in the after part of the boat. We could not allow the load of ice to grow beyond a certain point, and in turns we crawled about the decking forward, chipping and picking at it with the available tools. When daylight came on the morning of the sixth day out, we saw and felt that the James Caird had lost her resiliency. She was not rising to the oncoming seas. The weight of the ice that had formed in her and upon her during the night was having its effect, and she was becoming more like a log than a boat. The situation called for immediate action. We first broke away the spare oars, which were encased in ice and frozen to the sides of the boat, and threw them overboard. We retained two oars for use when we got in shore. Two of the fur sleeping bags went over the side. They were thoroughly wet, weighing probably 40 pounds each, and they had frozen stiff during the night. Three men constituted the watch below, and when a man went down, it was better to turn into the wet bag just vacated by another man than to thaw out a frozen bag with the heat of his own unfortunate body. We now had four bags, three in use, and one for emergency use in case a member of the party should break down permanently. The reduction of weight relieved the boat to some extent, and vigorous chipping and scraping did more. We had to be very careful not to put axe or knife through the frozen canvas of the decking as we crawled over it, but gradually we got rid of a lot of ice. The James Caird lifted to the endless waves as though she lived again. 
About 11am, the boat suddenly fell off into the trough of the sea. The painter had parted and the sea anchor had gone. This was serious. The James Caird went away to Leward, and we had no chance at all of recovering the anchor and our valuable rope, which had been our only means of keeping the boat's head up to the seas without the risk of hoisting sail in a gale. Now we had to set the sail and trust to its holding. While the James Caird rolled heavily in the trough, we beat the frozen canvas until the bulk of the ice had cracked off it and then hoisted it. The frozen gear worked protestingly, but after a struggle, our little craft came up to the wind again and we breathed more freely. Skin frostbites were troubling us and we had developed large blisters on our fingers and hands. I shall always carry the scar of one of these frostbites on my left hand, which became badly inflamed after the skin had burst and the cold had bitten deeply. We held the boat up to the gale during that day, enduring as best we could discomforts that amounted to pain. The boat tossed interminably on the big waves under grey threatening skies. Our thoughts did not embrace much more than the necessities of the hour. Every surge of the sea was an enemy to be watched and circumvented. We ate our scanty meals, treated our frostbites, and hoped for the improved conditions that the morrow might bring. Night fell early, and in the lagging hours of darkness we were cheered by a change for the better in the weather. The wind dropped, the snow squalls became less frequent, and the sea moderated. When the morning of the seventh day dawned, there was not much wind. We shook the reef out of the sail and laid our course once more for South Georgia. The sun came out bright and clear, and presently Worsley got a snap for longitude. We hoped that the sky would remain clear until noon, so that we could get the latitude. We had been six days out without an observation, and our dead reckoning naturally was uncertain. The boat must have presented a strange appearance that morning. All hands basked in the sun. We hung our sleeping bags to the mast, and spread our socks and other gear all over the deck. Some of the ice had melted off the James Caird in the early morning after the gale began to slacken and dry patches were appearing in the decking. Porpoises came blowing round the boat and Cape pigeons wheeled and swooped within a few feet of us. These little black and white birds have an air of friendliness that is not possessed by the great circling albatross. They had looked grey against the swaying sea during the storm as they darted about over our heads and uttered their plaintive cries. The albatrosses of the black or sooty variety had watched with hard, bright eyes and seemed to have a quite impersonal interest in our struggle to keep afloat amid the battering seas. In addition to the Cape Pigeons, an occasional stormy petrel flashed overhead. Then there was a small bird, unknown to me, that appeared always to be in a fussy, bustling state, quite out of keeping with the surroundings. It irritated me. It had practically no tail, and it flitted about vaguely as though in search of the lost member. I used to find myself wishing it would find its tail, and have done with the silly fluttering. We revelled in the warmth of the sun that day. Life was not so bad after all. We felt we were well on our way, our gear was drying, and we could have a hot meal in comparative comfort. The swell was still heavy, but it was not breaking, and the boat rowed easily. At noon, Worsley balanced himself on the gunwale and clung with one hand to the stay of the mainmast 
while he got a snap of the sun. The result was more than encouraging. We had done over 380 miles and were getting on for halfway to South Georgia. It looked as though we were going to get through. The wind freshened to a good stiff breeze during the afternoon and the James Caird made satisfactory progress. I had not realised until the sunlight came how small our boat really was. There was some influence in the light and warmth, some hint of happier days that made us revive memories of other voyages, when we had stout decks beneath our feet, unlimited food at our command, and pleasant cabins for our ease. Now we clung to a battered little boat, alone, alone, all, all alone, alone on a wide, wide sea. So low in the water were we, that each succeeding swell cut off our view of the skyline. We were a tiny speck in the vast vista of the sea, the ocean that is open to all and merciful to none, that threatens even when it seems to yield, and that is pitiless always to weakness. For a moment, the consciousness of the forces arrayed against us would be almost overwhelming. Then hope and confidence would rise again as our boat rose to a wave and tossed aside the crest in a sparkling shower like the play of prismatic colours at the foot of a waterfall. My double-barrelled gun and some cartridges had been stowed aboard the boat as an emergency precaution against a shortage of food. But we were not disposed to destroy our little neighbours, the Cape Pigeons, even for the sake of fresh meat. We might have shot an albatross, but the wandering king of the ocean aroused in us something of the feeling that inspired too late the ancient mariner. So the gun remained among the stores and sleeping bags in the narrow quarters beneath our leaking deck, and the birds followed us unmolested. The eighth, ninth and tenth days of the voyage had few features worthy of special note. The wind blew hard during those days, and the strain of navigating the boat was unceasing, but always we made some advance towards our goal. No berg showed on our horizon, and we knew that we were clear of the ice fields. Each day brought its little round of troubles, but also compensation in the form of food and growing hope. We felt that we were going to succeed. The odds against us had been great, but we were winning through. We still suffered severely from the cold, for though the temperature was rising, our vitality was declining owing to shortage of food, exposure and the necessity of maintaining our cramped positions day and night. I found that it was now absolutely necessary to prepare hot milk for all hands during the night in order to sustain life till dawn. This meant lighting the primus lamp in the darkness and involved an increased drain on our small store of matches. It was the rule that one match must serve when the primus was being lit. We had no lamp for the compass and during the early days of the voyage we would strike a match when the steersman wanted to see the course at night. But later, the necessity for strict economy impressed itself upon us, and the practice of striking matches at night was stopped. We had one watertight tin of matches. I had stowed away in a pocket, in readiness for a sunny day, a lens from one of the telescopes, but this was of no use during the voyage. The sun seldom shone upon us. The glass of the compass got broken one night, and we contrived to mend it with adhesive tape from the medicine chest. One of the memories that comes to me from those days 
is of Crean singing at the tiller. He always sang while he was steering, and nobody ever discovered what the song was. It was devoid of tune, and as monotonous as the chanting of a Buddhist monk at his prayers, yet somehow it was cheerful. In moments of inspiration, Crean would attempt the wearing of the green. On the tenth night, Worsley could not straighten his body after his spell at the tiller. He was thoroughly cramped, and we had to drag him beneath the decking and massage him before he could unbend himself and get into a sleeping bag. A hard northwesterly gale came up on the eleventh day and shifted to the southwest in the late afternoon. The sky was overcast, and occasional snow squalls added to the discomfort produced by a tremendous cross sea, the worst I thought that we had experienced. At midnight I was at the tiller, and suddenly noticed a line of clear sky between the south and southwest. I called to the other men that the sky was clearing, and then a moment later I realised that what I had seen was not a rift in the clouds, but the white crest of an enormous wave. During twenty-six years' experience of the ocean in all its moods, I had not encountered a wave so gigantic. It was a mighty upheaval of the ocean, a thing quite apart from the big white-capped seas that had been our tireless enemies for many days. I shouted, For God's sake, hold on, it's got us. Then came a moment of suspense that seemed drawn out into hours. White surged the foam of the breaking sea around us. We felt our boat lifted and flung forward like a cork in breaking surf. We were in a seething chaos of tortured water, but somehow the boat lived through it, half full of water, sagging to the dead weight and shuddering under the blow. We bailed with the energy of men fighting for life, flinging the water over the sides with every receptacle that came to our hands. And after ten minutes of uncertainty, we felt the boat renew her life beneath us. She floated again and ceased to lurch drunkenly, as though dazed by the attack of the sea. Earnestly, we hoped that never again we would encounter such a wave. The conditions in the boat, uncomfortable before, had been made worse by the deluge of water. All our gear was thoroughly wet again. Our cooking stove had been floating about in the bottom of the boat, and portions of our last hoosh seemed to have permeated everything. Not until 3 a.m., when we were all chilled almost to the limit of endurance, did we manage to get the stove alight and make ourselves hot drinks. The carpenter was suffering particularly, but he showed grit and spirit. Vincent had, for the past week, ceased to be an active member of the crew, and I could not easily account for his collapse. Physically, he was one of the strongest men in the boat. He was a young man. He had served on North Sea trawlers, and he should have been able to bear hardships better than McCarthy, who, not so strong, was always happy 